Alright, for some of you that were wondering about the uh, <coughs> design process of creating a root style supercharger. Um, what we have here is a two lobe rotor. Um, obviously this isn't the same as my first design. I used a three lobe for the first design but I've since changed my mind after making a mistake with it in the assembly process. Um, so. I've made this one, um, this is for demonstration purposes only, um, it uses simple radio, uh, you can see the construction geometry here, if I highlight it, yeah, well, sort of, there's a circle there um, in the blue, and you can see that that there is what drives this curve, um, and we can see here by our dimension, 12.72, that is just a plain and simple radius around a point, which is right there. Now, <coughs> it looks like a <coughs> low. <coughs> pardon me. It looks like a low rotor, but uh, the problem with these is when you create your second rotor and your relationship between the two is that they will not maintain correct clearances between the two lobes as they rotate against each other. Um, for that reason we have to go and use what's called uh, an epicycloid and a hypercycloid curve in order to create correct shape but I'll use this one so I can show you the problems uh, that we'll have if we were to say use this as our finished design um, I have already an assembly with the parts sitting in here, not that one, sorry that one there Alright, so you can see I have my housing, which is that sucker right there. And we have our two lobes. Uh, as you can see, at the moment they're just floating around in space. I can move them wherever I want. That is not really any good to us. So what we have to do is create a relationship between the parts to the housing so that we can simulate our uh, rotation and see the clearance issues we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select Mate Surfaces and I'm going to zoom in select the surface that I want to mate and then select the other surface there now what SolarWorks does is it's quite clever is it figures out that I want to make those two cylindrical surfaces um, concentric to each other uh, so it'll do it automatically for me and ask me if that's correct of course it is so we say go ahead so now we have them both mated so as you can see we can still move them around but the problem is is they will not move out of concentricity of those two circles our next option is that we want to mate the bottom side of the rotors to the bottom of the housing now naturally uh, in the actual machining application of these the bottom of the rotors will never touch the housing but when we design stuff we design it exact exact for size and then we introduce our tolerancing uh, in the drawing specs so we can manufacture to what we require alright so now we have them fixed in the housing so they can't move up and down they can't move off the center of rotation but they still move individually to each other which is obviously also no good so what we do is we're going to bring that face towards us uh, this isn't the correct way of doing this it's just a, for an icrometer and we're going to set them at 90 degrees apart from each other like so I'm just using my bolt holes to line up on just get a visual it's not very good but for this it's fine and then we're going to go back into our mate selection we'll select our two surfaces except for this time we're going to go to the little drop down menu and select a gear so we're going to gear those together and you see it chucks up a little dialogue here asking me the ratio now in this case it's one to one, that's bang on, so we go OK. So now we have the lobes fixed together, you can see they counter rotate. Looks all pretty and fancy. And you kind of look at that and go, hey, it's a supercharger, it'll do the job. But problem that we encounter, and again this is using the simple radii to create the uh, the lobes, uh, is if we zoom right in, you can see at this point here we have a good, ignore the rendering of my shitty computer, um, you can see we have a good relationship of fit between both the outer housing here and the rotor. Remember these are size for size so in theory the line should touch 
if the rendering wasn't so bad. And there's good. But as we rotate the lobe through its path movement, you can see that we have this issue of the lobes opening up this big ass gap here. And that is probably, I mean, I, I can measure it, but I won't bother. You know, that's an excess of a millimeter now in a, a situation where we're trying to compress air any compression that we create early on in stroke will be instantaneously lost by that lack of um, tolerance maintained between the rotors as they rotate effectively making it nothing but a big air churner doing nothing so that is rubbish now what we need to do is we need to create a rotor with epicycloids and hypercycloid curves now you can see here on this nice little shape is that this curve here is not a constant radius you'll notice that I have a hole here that's central to this curve but the radius is or well, it's not a radius it's called a spline because there's no one fixed point if I was to try and dimension that with a smart dimension it's it doesn't know what to do because there's no size on that I can I can give myself point locations but it's not actually going to tell me anything and when I do a dimension cannot be created from the selected items um, you can see the other circles that are sitting here um, that there is construction geometry from uh, creating the cycloids and curves um, tradition typically you will use uh, a parametric driven equation to give yourself these curves uh, but on my old 2006 version of SOLIDWORKS it doesn't give me the option of doing parametric equation driven curves so what I've had to do is come to this fantastic website here where it shows me how to draw cycloids using construction geometry techniques it's pretty simple uh, you have two curves you have your your <coughs> um, your uh, drive circle which is that one so in this case here if we come back to here that there uh, the drive circle so uh, actually we'll go back one step even more if we take a look at this little photo here it gives us our geometry for a hypercycloid type rotor construction for a two lobe rotor now you can see here we have this diameter up on the black line that's called our pitch diameter and then we have this little value here which is diameter divided by 4 and that there is what gives us our top and bottom diameters for the sizes back over here this line here which is just turned green you can hardly see is our major diameter and this small diameter here is the bottom diameter of the two and that there is the center of our driving uh, not our driving our driven circle so if I draw a circle around this point and make it tangential to that now that in theory should be perfectly 9.665 of a millimeter and you can see there 9.665 so it tells me my construction geometry was correct which is always handy we don't need that so we'll delete it Alright, so back to how we draw it. So we have our two curves now, our drive curve and our driven curve, or our driven circle. And then what we need to do is we need to figure out uh, how many degrees of the cycloid that we want. Now in our case we want for the uh, epicycloid, we want 90 degrees, and for the hypercycloid we want 90 degrees so that we can get our four points of contact. Uh, you can see here we have a little dot um, that there's the start and finish of the curves um, I can't remove that, it's just a reference geometry again um, it doesn't show up once you extrude the model but if we come here we can close that you can see we draw the circle, we divide it into 12 equal sections and then we create curves from those 12 equal sections and then we draw circles relating from number one line to the number one intersection point on that circle number two line number two intersection point and so on and so forth and so we get these points across this this arc or these bunch of arcs here and then what we use is a spline tool 
which basically lets us draw any pretty old curve that we want and you can see how the curves automatically update to each other relative to anything else so because a cycloid is uh, a, a constantly changing arc the once I've plotted my points for the cycloid the the spline tool automatically updates everything required to give me the shape that I need for the spline and it works fantastic and then as you can see once we use the extrude tool um, so this is what we use to actually turn our sketch into a three dimensional part so we would select our sketch um, and extrude it to a set length so in this case here it's 50 millimeters um, that's great that would give us a solid model and you can see I've got some holes through it as well um, so I have one hole reference for cutting the 12 millimeter shaft diameter and two holes for 16 millimeter um, just material removal for inertial uh, rotational inertia issues uh, just to get rid of some mess and there's our finished part um, now I know it's not particularly ideal uh, I have actually had to the theory if I had done everything perfect or if I used a parametric driven equation I would have a perfect cycloid now due to the constraints of construction geometry to create this I do have some uh, some pitch errors um, so when I've come to my assembly to put the parts together yes, um, I did have some interference issues so what I've had to do is scale the um, the, the rotors in relationship to the X and Y axes uh, to basically narrow them up a little bit as I was getting a small amount of contact just at this point here but as you can see now I have this nice little gap there which is 0.05 of a millimetre um, and then I have that equal size gap on the outside of the outside of the housing so we're running a clearance of 0.1 total um, between the housing and the rotor and 0.1 between the well 0.5 between the rotors I guess but 